So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base, how do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number seven. Hello, Real Estate Underground. This is Ed Matthews, and I'm here with my Yoda, Richard Brown, my partner in crime. Good afternoon, Rich. And we are really excited to have attorney Timothy Getz joining us. Tim, welcome, and thanks for your time. Good afternoon, guys. So one of the reasons we were really excited to meet with you was, first and foremost, you're an attorney and you see quite a few deals. And so you have an interesting view on the market. And you're also a real estate investor. So not only do you bring the legal experience to the table, but you actually know what guys like me and Rich do for a living and our audience for that matter. So uh, welcome. And again, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Why don't we get into your background. Rich and I have known you for quite some time, but I wanted to give that benefit to the audience and have them understand who you are and why you're here and what makes you awesome. So sure. we're going to run through that. Sure. Yeah. I am a real estate attorney. I've been licensed for almost 11 years now, both in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And so just the way my practice has evolved over time, it's really been, I would say probably 50, 60% investor clients clients that are doing five plus closings a year. I've got clients that do 60, some that do a dozen, and some that do just one or two. In that process of doing closings for real estate investors, I realized I did a closing for a friend actually, and they bought a condo, a cheap condo in West Hartford. And I said, geez, you can buy condos this cheap? And I saw what the rent was and I'm like, this just makes total sense. And a light bulb went off and I said, I should do this. And, you know, I've got opportunities, some of the costs I can manage myself as far as legal fees and title search fees. So it just ended up being, we bought our first condo. My wife and I were actually the partnership and it snowballed from there, you know, one turned into two and three, and now we've got seven condos all in the same complex. And we've got one commercial property in Avon and a vacation home in Newport, Rhode Island. So that's kind of how the portfolio grew. But as far as my background, it's been 10 years of a lot of closings, especially the last three or four years. I mean, again, it just grew to a lot of investors. So I can imagine that given the current climate here in Connecticut and actually throughout the U.S., you probably are quite busy these days. Yeah, I would say the last three years, we've been up 40% every year over the last three years. Um, I don't know what part of that's attributed to natural growth because I'm still 10 years old. I've actually 10 years practicing law, four years in Massachusetts. I was in Worcester, Mass for four years, but basically six years plus here in Connecticut on my own. And I'm not sure what part of that's natural growth of a business and what part of that's just the market just driving the business. But it's just every year it's been 40% more, 40% more. So I'll probably do about 500 closings this year, just myself and one paralegal. So yeah, I remember... Four years ago, I just hit 100. Thought it was a big deal. Four years later, I'm at 500. So just kind of shows you how the market has just exploded. At this rate, a couple, three years from now, you'll be at 1,000. (laughs) I can't even imagine. Maybe I'll have to hire another paralegal. Ed, maybe we should be investing in Tim's business instead of real estate. Oh, my <laughs> yeah, God. Exactly. That you know, it's funny. Phenomenal. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> but you know what that yes. comes with, too? I've been very lucky. And I'll be the first right. to admit luck plays a huge part in success. And so I was lucky. I was at the right place at the right time, met the right people. And I don't even know how I got these. I've got three really large investor clients. And I don't even know how it happened. I do know... But it's just how does one person get so lucky within a two-year span to meet three really large investor clients? That's more than half my business. Right. I'm a big believer in luck favors the prepared. Tim, I mean, one of the things that is really important to me, and I think we've harped on it here, is relationships, right? So tell us about how you nurture those relationships with those significant clients. I think when someone's trying to grow their business, that's a really important piece. The first conversation I have with a new client is what are your concerns? What do you want to see accomplished? What was a bad experience you've had in the past? And I just try and smart the exact opposite. (laughs) My biggest investor client, their biggest concern was the attorney that they were working with wasn't accessible. They couldn't get through the attorney. They had to go through the paralegal or the receptionist first. 
and they weren't flexible with closing times and closing locations. And if you're going to give me 60 closings a year, I'll drive to your office for every closing. You don't have to drive here. And that's what they were making them do. And so things like that, being accessible all the time. I'm amazed sometimes when I hear that attorneys don't give out their cell phone numbers. And maybe I'm not making many friends here because I'm saying this, but that's the first thing that I do. I give out my cell phone number. I want you to text me. I want you to call me. I want you to be successful. If you're successful, I'm successful. So the main one is just accessibility. That's fantastic. Building the relationships again, just making sure that you do the right thing. If, if something went wrong on a transaction, it's a minor detail. Or it might've been a mistake that your office made. I didn't want the client to know about it. I'll cover it. If it was a minor, minor thing, it doesn't affect them at all. I'll make it good. And the transaction that they bargained for is the one that I'm going to give them. Outstanding. I love it. I love it. That's great <laughs> advice for all investors. No matter where you are in the food chain, so to speak, I think it's just important that you pay attention to who your customers are and what their needs are and cater to those. It's 2021. If you're not texting your clients now, I don't know. Yeah. Not much we can do for you, right? Right. That's how business is going to be. I'd rather be out in front of that than behind it. Absolutely. With the market being so hot, what are you telling your investors? What are your investors seeing? What's keeping them up at night? Or are they sleeping well right now? You know, it's so funny. I've had this conversation with a bunch of people and I've got the heavy investor clients are acting total opposites. One sold everything they could last year. They sold everything. They, get, they were getting great prices. They cashed out on things they bought six months earlier. And they're holding on to all that money. And they're just going to wait for the foreclosures to start to kick in. And then I've got clients that bought everything they possibly could because they realize the rents are going up so quickly that they want to get in when prices are low enough. The rents, you know, and so their cap rate is just going to go up because rents are naturally going to go up. So I got two clients doing the exact opposite thing and both wildly successful last year. So I think it just it depends on what your model is. Yeah. So you mentioned something about foreclosures. And I'm curious, given your view into the marketplace and how broad it is, what do you see in terms of the wave of foreclosures that are coming? Pull out your crystal ball. Uh, this is a tough one because every time you think you're getting to the end of it, it gets extended further and extended further. And I think someone told me this morning, the executive orders were extended again for Governor Lamont. But I don't know. Everyone else I've talked to, everyone that was in with the banks that are doing the foreclosing, is it's going to just be a wave. And right. I can't predict what's going to happen. If it's just going to be, if the banks are going to do a slow trickle of this stuff, or are they going to just put everything on the market all at once? It'd be smart if they did a trickle, right? I mean, they could get better money for these properties, but sometimes banks don't do what makes sense. <laughs> so That's true. a question yeah. I just totally can't answer because... I've got no idea. Every time you think you've got an idea, something happens that just throws that out the window. Couldn't agree more. Personally, I've been waiting since last March for this to happen, <laughs> right? I hear you. But in terms of what this wave of foreclosure is going to look like, my guess is that it's going to look a lot like 08, 09, 2010, 11, and 12, right? And like you said, Tim, it's probably going to be a trickle. But there will be those banks that they're not in the business of carrying real estate assets on their balance sheets and they're going to dump them. And the smart investor is going to figure out which banks those are and how to get out in front of that wave. Any thoughts, Rich? I think it's going to be, as you said, bank specific, as we know, and hopefully folks who are listening to this podcast know, you have some banks who have entered the rehab game and they are remodeling their own properties, their own assets before putting them on the market. Not to say that they are doing them to the standards that we would do them to. I've walked through some of them and been surprised. And then you have other banks who basically, when they're up against the quarter end or they're up against the year end, they take a more aggressive approach to getting yeah. rid of the properties. So I think it's going to be bank specific. Some banks will be more conservative and trickle them on. I think you'll have some banks as they're trying to clean up their balance sheets, they'll just say, hey, if we can get a bunch of these done and off the books, let's do that. So for us as investors, I think it's going to be keeping your nose to the grindstone, making sure that you're nurturing relationships. You're making friends with people like Tim. <laughs> you're right. making friends with the right. REO guys, and you're just paying attention to the headlines. And you've got yeah. some cash, some dry powder, so that you can strike while the iron's hot. Absolutely. One of the other things that I'm not sure how it's going to play out, I mean, it's not a more of a long-term thing, but HUD properties, right? I think BLB lost the contract for the asset manager on HUD properties. Yeah. So we've got a couple now 
And we were basically just told, sit tight for two months and we'll get back to you when we're ready to close. And so that's going to be another cog in the chain there is that all these foreclosures, sales that were supposed to happen over the last two months are going to just get pushed on even further. Buying investment real estate is both thrilling and sometimes stressful. Without a lending expert by your side, most investors don't stand a chance. That's where CT Rea Funding comes in. CT Rea Funding was founded by investors to help investors just like you fund their deals. Whether you're buying a single family rehab, an apartment building, or really any investment property, our team will understand your deal and help you close quickly. Go to ctreiafunding.com or call us at 860-876-0572. Both you and Tim and Rich you said similar things in, in that you've got to build relationships, right? You've got to dig your well before you're thirsty because when it does come, it's going to come in pretty fast. And if you're trying to create those relationships as the wave of foreclosed properties are hitting the market, you're going to be behind the process. Get to know these people, get to know people like Tim and the REOs and the officers who own these balance sheets at the banks, get to know them now. So six, 12, however many months from now, they start to release these properties. You're ready to catch them. And that includes condos. So Tim, going back to condos, you said you've been a condo investor for a long time. And how are you feeling about condos these days? Are you feeling differently about the condo market than you do from the resi market or the commercial market? For us, condos is more out of convenience because both work 60, 70, 80 hours a week. So being a property manager, in addition to uh, a business owner, was just not practical. So condos were really the only option that we had. I'm feeling good because the rents continue to go up. And every time we've got a vacancy, you've got 30, 40 people lined up for showings. So from that perspective, I feel good. The one downside that I do see to it is a lot of condos pay for the water bill. And water bills are are through the roof right now. Same thing with the electric bills. So that you could be a a slight increase in condo fees, I think, in assessments that might be coming soon just because of those common costs are just going up. But again, I I feel good just because the rents are just so good there. I mean, I think that's happening everywhere. And you mentioned you were in the commercial space. How is that going for you? Any concerns, any thoughts, any predictions? Well, that's not going very well. It's a mid-sized commercial space, and we bought it at the absolute worst time. We bought it back in March of last year. And so, yeah, so, I mean, right before COVID was just starting and right before things started to shut down is when we bought it. And we unfortunately had three of our four tenants. The leases were expiring by the end of the year. And like a lot of businesses, they've got multiple locations the first lease up is the lease that they're not going to renew, and we got hit with three of those. So we're having a little struggle with that property now. I'm hopeful that it's a mid-size office space. There's four suites that, as the bigger guys start to downsize, that they'll take up spaces like ours. But right now, that is a concern. I, I'm, I thought we'd see some more activity with the commercial renters, but we're just not. And it's office space, too. It's not retail. So the retail stuff, I think, will be fine. But the office space is just tough to fill because there's so many people working from home and businesses got used to not having people there. So that's our struggle. And I know you have another property that's out of state. How's that working for you? That's doing good. Vacation rentals are great. That's almost the direction I think that we kind of want to go moving forward is vacation rentals. Airbnb couldn't be any easier to use. Money's great. It's nice to have a vacation home to go to yourself. The depreciation, the write-offs, and there's, it's a win-win in our book. We got a great interest rate. So I think the vacation rentals are something that we're really going to try and focus on going forward. Okay. Right. Now, does that mean you're looking to expand that portfolio? And if you're talking to another investor, would you tell them to explore the Airbnb uh, space? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually have told a few of my investor clients that they should consider that. Even last year with shutdowns and people not traveling as much, we still found that I feel like the Connecticut shoreline was really busy because people couldn't travel out of state. So they took advantage of went to the shoreline and that was happening in Rhode Island. People couldn't travel out of state. They said, all right, let's just stay local. I don't see a downside to that really. And it's an asset that's going to go up in value anyway. So even if you have a bad year, we originally were going to look at the Cape. 
but we decided on Newport instead. But yeah, no, I, I recommended that to several clients just because the return just ended up being so good. Awesome. And it's, it just diversifies the portfolio too, right? And I've got a client now that's they're b- trying to build a really big portfolio, a lot of residential, a lot of commercial. And I suggested to them that they really consider the vacation rentals too. Tim, getting back to your clients, I know you see small, medium, large, gigantic clients, right? So what do you think separates the really successful real estate entrepreneurs from the ones who are teeny tiny or are just dreaming and looking to get started? Experience is definitely something that that you can't replace, but you got to get experience. And so to get experience, you have to pull the trigger on things. I get a lot of phone calls from wholesalers or people that want to wholesale. It's a very hot thing right now, but I get for every one that we actually go through a transaction with, we've got five that just can't pull the trigger on something. They're just afraid to have a bad deal. And I think that's the thing. You have to be willing to fail and willing to have a bad deal happen. You're not going to be perfect. So you can't be afraid to have that transaction go bad. Obviously, you don't want it to. You're going to try everything you can to have that not happen, but you can't be afraid to fail. And the ones that that get really big, you know, you talk to them. They've done so many deals, and let's share stories about bad deals. And they took the risk, but the same risk that they failed on is the same risk that gave them this home run. So right, um, right. you got to be willing to take a risk. Absolutely. So obviously you've got a lot of experience and I'm sure you've had mentors who have helped you along the way. So let me ask you, I mean, what's the best advice you ever gotten? Who gave it to you? There's two bits of advice. One came from my father and it was just a passing comment. It wasn't like a word of wisdom moment. And it was just, no one gets rich on 40 hours a week. And I just, that kind of just stuck with me. It's you've right. got to do the extra. If you really want to make it and really pull in good money and be successful, 40 hours a week is just not going to do it. That would be one. And the other one would be, this came from a professor in law school. And he said, you know, it's just very simple. Just be nice. Be nice to people. Be likable. You're not perfect. You're going to make mistakes. But man, if people like you, they're willing to look past mistakes. And they're willing to forgive a lot more. They don't like you and you're a jerk. They're not going to give you any leeway. So but true. if they like you, you get away with a lot more if you're a likable person. Tim, I'll tell you from personal experience, I'm a partner in a group called CT Ria. And I tell you, I make a lot of mistakes. And thank goodness these guys think I'm a nice guy or else they would have <laughs> to boot me out a long time ago. I don't say that's not, you know, that's not true. A, I, you haven't made a mistake yet. So I tend to live my life by what Rich Brown tells me to do. If he told me to shave my head and, and wear a Yoda t-shirt, I might actually consider it. But the fact is, you know, Rich, to you, we're so happy you joined the team here, and we're thrilled that you're bringing what you bring to the table to our family. So, Tim, it's awesome. yeah, no, you're spot on, Tim. It, those are yeah. very wise words indeed, and Absolutely. I think go a long way. It goes back to, for me, relationships are so important, and it goes back to being able to strengthen relationships, right? If someone knows you, they know your integrity, right. they know that you're a person of your word, and something goes wrong with the transaction – they know that you weren't trying to take advantage of them, right? And, and so it's easier to resolve the situation because they know that your intentions were honorable and pure versus if it's someone whose your reputation is that you always try to get the best of every deal and you take advantage of everyone in that chance, then there are going to be people who don't want to do business with you because they just think you're a jerk. Right. And it even goes with tenants too. If you're nice to your tenants and you've got a good relationship, and something goes wrong, it's just so much easier to manage that relationship and not let things go south if they like you. I mean, you're going to forget to send the handyman over. You're going to get sidetracked. You get to get something prepared in time. And if your tenant knows you, they're just going to send you a quick reminder, but they're not going to ask you or make it a big deal because they know you're a likable person. You're nice to them. It was just a, a minor oversight. Yeah. So Tim, I'm curious, you're an attorney, which means you read for a living, and I'm sure it's more technical books than real estate and business books. So what are some of the books that are on your nightstand that you've been meaning to read and haven't gotten to yet? So yeah, very true. I haven't really read for pleasure since law school, and that wasn't for pleasure either. I was going to say, read for pleasure in law school? (laughs) No, that that seems pretty painful to me. (laughs) The two books books on my nightstand, or or my virtual nightstand, I guess, is Leaders Eat Last, which I think is a popular book. And then another one is called 212 or 212, The Extra Degree. I love that book. 
And I just find that that is a concept that I just remind myself of almost every night as I'm working at 1130 at night, why I'm doing that. And it's just the idea that at 211 degrees, it's just hot water. At 212, it's boiling water. Right. And boiling water creates steam and steam can move a train. And it's just that extra degree of work can change everything. It's, it's a it's fantastic book. Yeah. I mean, I haven't read it, but you know, yeah. I've read summaries of it. I've heard people talk about it. And that, that's one that I really want to get to. Absolutely. Yeah. A coach once told me the only two things you can control in any situation are your attitude and your effort, right? Mm-hmm. And that one additional degree, one extra percentage of effort can change your state and your situation immediately. And you don't know where that is. You just have to keep on going forward and keep on working harder. You don't know where that extra degree actually is and where it happened. So I got to ask, you obviously have a very successful practice. And from an attorney's perspective, you could have done anything, right? You could have gone into litigation, corporate law, whatever. And a gigantic piece of your practice and actually what you do outside of your practice is real estate. What drew you in? As far as law goes, I want it to be transactional. And yep. so there's nothing more transactional than a uh, real estate transaction. So that's, that's how that kind of ended up. But personally, the flexibility of real estate, the security actually, you know, it's a secure asset. It's not going anywhere. It's not like investing in the market where you can lose everything. I mean, you're never going to lose at everything with real estate property because the property is not going to go anywhere. There's always extreme examples, but it can always be an income producing asset for you. Even in bad years, it, it can probably be an income producing asset. Obviously you've got the tax depreciation and the write-off, those are great things. But historically the appreciation, to me it's just, I'm a very safe person. I like safe things and I find real estate to be the safest investment that I can make. And in addition, it's a really good return on the investment. The cap rates that we're getting on these condos is 12 cap rate on almost all of them. That's Where can nice. I earn 12% in the market every year and claim the deductions and claim the write-offs and have this constant cash flow. And that's the other thing too. It's just constant cash flow, which is comforting feeling to know that money is coming in each month. Mailbox money is a beautiful thing. It's not passive money. You know, everyone says it's passive. It's definitely not passive. You got to work for it, but it is a nice revenue stream. So, so tell us more about that. We've talked about your condo deals and your commercial deal. I'm just curious, is there one that you're particularly proud of, or maybe you could Give us a cautionary tale to kind of wave us and our audience off of, don't do what I did. Obviously, buying something as COVID was starting, maybe not the best idea. We were clearly, we were under contract before things sure. really go south. But having three or four leases expire within the same three-month span, I think we were just so happy to get the property. And again, it was a great cap rate at the time. It would have been a great investment. But yep. you know, the, the risk of having three leases expire in three months. That was, and if we like 90% of our rents were expiring in a three month span, that was a little bit risky. And if they had all renewed, I would have been telling you the exact opposite. This would be my proud moment, but it didn't work out that way. So, I mean, that is something that I would kind of caution people. Obviously you never know what's going to happen now, but making sure that you've got steady income, at least for the first few years, that would be something that I would look back on and say, ah, Maybe we kind of just figure this out and pump the brakes a little bit. Yeah. But here's the cool thing about that. You now own an asset that if I've learned anything about real estate over my own 10 years of doing this is that time heals a lot of ills, right? And so I would imagine as we emerge from this COVID world and things start to rationalize and people start coming back to the office, six months from now, you're probably going to be high-fiving your wife and business partners because of the fact that this is working and it's starting to perform again, right? Yeah, that's something that we've talked to our financial advisor. We run the numbers and it's a little blip, right? It's a little blip in the long 30-year plan. But 30 years from from now, we're going to look back and say this was a great investment. Awesome. Well, I wish you well. So part of my business, and so I tend to be biased in my thinking in this respect, I love repurposing buildings, buying an industrial building and turning it into something else, right? Or buying a commercial office building and turning it into condos or apartments. Have you looked at doing anything like that with it? We haven't. It's in a professional office park. So there's going to be some restrictions on what we can do there. Right. But there is one person actually that they had the same thing happen to them, I believe. And they had their entire floor was vacant. So it's their condos and you've got, you know, I think there's eight different buildings and each building has a second level. We own the second floor. 
and someone else had a pure vacancy for their entire floor. And they turned it into almost like Regis or okay. spaces. And they just Smart. built like 18 different single use offices. And so that's the route that they took. I'm not sure how successful they were, but that's not crossed okay. our mind. But, you know, yeah. I, I would like the more traditional space with the four different suites. And I'd love to have four tenants with 10 year leases. That's what we're hoping for. Nirvana. Yeah, good. Well, Tim, thank you very much for spending so much time with us. I'm just curious, when you're not practicing law or doing your own deals, what do you like to do outside of work? There's not much of that time. I have a three and a half year old son. So any moments that I have where he's awake and I'm free, I spend them with him. Right. That's so. fantastic. Yeah. I, my uncle once asked me, do you have any hobbies? I said, yes, they're your nieces. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, obviously you're based in Connecticut. And so if people want to get in touch with you, reach out. What's the best way to get a hold of you? We've got the office line is, you know, 860-232-2322. Easy to remember. And my cell phone again is uh, 203-586-9092. Website, you can just Google my name and all the information is on our website. You can chat through the website, send us emails through the website. So, but getslaw.net is the actual web address. Excellent. Tim, always great catching up with you. Thank you, guys. Glad you're doing well. Looking forward to a successful 2021. And I don't see a slowdown at all. I think this is going to be a hot market for everybody for, I think, five years maybe. I, I just am not seeing any slowdown. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any headwinds either. I just think everything is just pointing to a crazy, busy real estate world for five to 10 years, which is great. Hello. But it's exhausting. Welcome to your lips. Your <laughs> yeah. lips. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? Well, Tim, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for your Thank time. you very much, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. This has been the Real Estate Underground Podcast, a CT RIA presentation. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. If there's a specific topic you want us to cover, post it in the comments. For more information on the Real Estate Underground Podcast or CT RIA, go to realestateundergroundpodcast.com or ctria.com. Until next time, happy investing. This has been the Real Estate Underground. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, undergrounders, remember your real estate journey begins with a simple step forward. Now get to it. Bye for now.